In this video, we'll be reviewing a hand from the 25k buy-in party poker millions event in the Caribbean. This hand is between two of the top tournament players in the world, Jason Kuhn and Eric Seidel, with combined live winnings of over $60 million. This is towards the beginning of the tournament, eight-handed, with both players holding over 100 big blinds and chips. <laughs> So Eric opens under the gun 2.5x with pocket fives, which we see is a standard play according to range converters GTO preflop charts, which were generated from Monker Solver. Although the under the gun range should be relatively tight, there is a big blind ante in play and the players are all deep stacked, which makes opening with most small pocket pairs and even a few combos of suited connectors plus EV. Straight to business. Oh, we've got fives against aces here. Yeah. Eric's opened the 20k and Jason's <laughs> made a 75 or 70, is it? Yeah, Eric's first bit of action. Yeah. Jason 3 bets 3.5x with aces, and we see that from a GTO standpoint, there really is no reason to trap with aces here, as Jason should want to begin building a pot, and overall his range is defending more often by raising instead of calling, as there are a number of players behind yet to act. Yeah. Straight away getting 3 bet, and you see they had a little chat when they sat down, oh how have you been in New York City, how's yeah, it been, all exactly. that, oh by the way here's a 3 bet. Well, Troy and Oscar, King Queen, and the big blind here, of course, would want to play, but I think Otsu against these two players. It's just a fold, yeah. Get the shot clock on him. <laughs> Eric with a pretty easy call. Yep. The action folds back around to Eric who calls, and we see that the solver is mostly calling with fives as well, although with Kuhn's larger sizing, it would make sense to do at least a bit more folding here due to the worse odds. Mm. <laughs> Not the five, but we've still got something. <laughs> now we need a four or five. The flop comes 6-3-7 rainbow and both players check. We see that although Pew is mostly betting here, it is also doing a decent amount of checking in Jason's shoes across most of its range, including with aces. On the one hand, when Jason 3 bets the under the gun opener, his range should be quite strong and therefore you would generally expect for him to see bet on most boards in position. However, on the other hand, this is one of the more unfavorable boards for him against the 3-bet callers range, which should include a number of smallish pocket pairs and suited connectors. If we take a look at the range explorer, we see that although Jason has an advantage in over pairs, he's at a disadvantage when it comes to straights, sets, and two pairs. Jason should have a lot of Broadway combo whiffs on this board as well, so checking behind with some frequency has the benefit of disguising his range overall, since in theory, he should also be checking back somewhat often with a number of his ace highs that have showdown value and don't want to bloat the pot or get blown off their equity. I like the yeah, Jason, of course, does check back. There. The turn is the two of clubs, and Eric checks again. Although, according to Pio, he should be mostly betting here, including with pocket fives. This seven high board now significantly favors the pre flop caller, particularly with Jason's check behind on the flop. And we also see that the solver is favoring a smaller bet, which makes sense since Jason's range should be more on the polarized side here, primarily comprised of mediocre equity hands such as ace and king highs, and some slow played high equity holdings such as over pairs and sets. As such, a small bet is preferable when taking into account the composition of Eric's range as a whole. 
for Eric's strongest holdings, a small bet should be able to begin building a pot with calls from a good portion of Jason's holdings, including weaker combos with some draw equity. Additionally, for Eric's medium strength holdings, a small bet can also obtain value while at the same time doesn't bloat the pot against hands Eric may be behind. And for the weaker portions of Eric's range, consisting of junk with no showdown value or marginal hands that are highly susceptible to being outdrawn on later streets, a small bet should produce some folds and deny equity for a decent portion of Jason's high card heavy range. Check back there again. These players playing yeah. a range game here, aren't they? This is a range that suits Eric way more than Jason. Um, yeah, that's what I was saying earlier on about the check on the flop there. But apart from you can get, you can still get your value on the next streets. Right, and he, and he protects the times when he's three bet here with yeah, overcards. The fours Jason there. checks back again, and we see that given Jason's check on the flop, the solver has increased its checking frequency since the turn card only makes the board more favorable to Eric's overall range. Some people in this spot may be anxious to bet with aces to avoid getting cracked and also to begin building the pot, but if we are thinking in terms of ranges, which is necessary to understand GTO, we have to keep in mind that from a probabilistic standpoint, it is more likely that Jason has ace or king high on this board and therefore leaning towards checking helps disguise his range. The fours there. Wow. Surprising to see him check right the second time. Yeah. I like personally a big bet here and then right like, you want to rep hoping that he's got that hand you know and he still makes a crying call you want Eric to but rep kind look, of a yeah a really big hand or nothing yeah he's gone for the hundred bitch bitch the river is the four of spades giving Eric a straight and decides to lead out with a 63% pot bet Interestingly, we see that the solver is mostly checking on this card, which is likely due in part to Eric's check on the turn. Right, if instead Eric had bet the turn small and Jason just called, we see that the solver continues betting nearly its entire range on the river other than with some ace and king highs that have some showdown value. But as played, we see that the solver prefers to do a lot of checking here including with this straight, which is essentially the nuts given both players' ranges. So why is this? Well, when facing a river decision, it is often critically important to think of the game from a meta perspective. That is, not only should we try to evaluate the villain's range, but we should also consider the villain's perception of our range given the action, or lack thereof, thus far. If Eric simply decided to check for a third time, it would be fair to assume that he has a decent percentage of marginal hands, such as lower pairs and stronger aces, in his range. Hands that have superior showdown value to weaker ace and king highs in Jason's range, but not strong enough to inflate the pot with value bets since, as discussed, Jason should have a decent amount of slow played stronger hands given this board. In contrast, you would expect that most of Eric's weaker hands without showdown value should have bet at some point on this favorable board. And we see in fact that almost all of Eric's combos which are weaker than ace high are betting here on the river. As a result, since a third check in Eric's shoes should project a range with a good percentage of marginal hands with some showdown value, this in turn should prompt Jason to bluff with some of his weaker ace or king high hands since these combos may not have showdown value given Eric's passive line and therefore may need to bluff to apply fold equity to a hand like ace king or ace queen. And we do see in fact that if Eric decided to check here, a decent portion of Jason's ace and king highs would fire. Additionally, we should expect many of Kuhn's stronger holdings to bet following a check as well, as we see that 100% of his overpairs should attempt to extract value by the river, given that no bets were placed on the flop or turn. So in either case, a check in Eric's shoes, even with a straight, does make sense, since there's a decent portion of Jason's range that should bet after a third check either as a bluff or for value. In contrast, when Eric instead decides to bet instead of check, some of the hands in Jason's range that would have bluffed following a check will instead fold, so some EV is lost. It's gonna get cold, I think. <laughs> Right, of course, Eric, of course, was your under the gun razor called a three bet? So it does have hands. Just look at that board, every one of them pairs. Yeah. You're just losing to all those small pairs, aren't you? Wow. 
I think he's raised. Yeah. Wow. I don't know what he's thinking there. He's thinking something different to me there. <laughs> Despite the relatively dangerous board, Jason decides to spring the trap and bumps it up 2.5x. Interestingly, we see that Pio does a significant amount of simply flatting with aces, and that some of these lower over pairs, such as queens, jacks, and even nines, have greater overall equity and EV than aces. This is likely due to the heavy blocker effects aces have to a number of ace high bluffs in Eric's range that would have taken this line. However, on the other hand, Jason's aces are very disguised given his passive play, so there is a strong possibility that he is ahead at this point. And when we are facing these types of conflicting factors between two different strategies, it will often be the case that the solver will do some mixing, and we do see in fact that the EVs are virtually identical between calling and raising small, so either play is generally okay from a GTO perspective. Well, he's trying to turn this hand into a bluff, I guess. He's trying to rip some 5x himself. <laughs> we'll see the timing yeah. a little off here, Roberto. Yeah. Not going to work in this instance. No. <laughs> Eric, I mean, none of it. I'm With the nuts, me. Eric raises it up to 700k and Jason snap folds as he quickly and correctly assesses that he is behind. And we do see that Pio does in fact fold most of its aces in this spot. Not only should the bluff to value ratio be smaller on the river in general, Eric also doesn't really have any natural 3 bet bluffs here either given his range. Right, if we take a look back at Eric's decision facing Jason's raise, we see that the solver is doing very little 3-bet bluffing in this spot, with only a very small percentage of ace and king highs. As such, although it can be quite difficult to lay down aces, at the end of the day, Jason has one pair on an extremely dangerous board against a narrow range that has a number of straights, sets, and two pairs in this spot. So I think it can be easy to be results oriented and suggest that Jason should have bet for protection on the flop and or turn, but for one, it's unclear if this hand would have played out any differently if he had done so, since Eric had both a pair and a gut shot on a board that should have missed most of Jason's range. Additionally, on a different runout, Jason's passive line could have allowed him to extract more value on later streets since his hand was very disguised. And finally, despite the immediate results, in the long run, Jason's disciplined slow play should put his opponents on notice that they need to exercise caution instead of mindlessly attacking his in-position checks. So that's the video for today. Thanks for watching, and until next time, stay balanced.